Welcome everyone to this doctoral thesis defense by Jai Yang. The title of the thesis is Utilization of Cellulosic Biomass Towards Sustainable Chemicals and Novel Biomaterials. My name is Ida Svanendal and I will be the chairperson of this session. I would like to start by introducing the participants. The main person today is the responding Jai Yang, who is the author of the work that will be presented and discussed here today. As faculty opponent, professor of chemical engineering for healthcare at KU Leuven and professor of biomass chemical engineering at Obo Academy University and vice president of the European Polysaccharide Network of Excellence. Welcome, Pedro Fardim. We also have an examination committee consisting of three persons from uh, Obo Academy University. Welcome University Lecturer Anna Sundberg. From Chalmers University of Technology, Professor in Organic Chemistry. Welcome Gunnar Westman. And from Norion, welcome Dr. Leif Karlsson. Jai's main supervisor has been Professor Magnus Nordgren, Mid-Sweden University. Co-supervisor co has been Professor Håkan Edlund, Mid-Sweden University. The procedure of today's session is as follows. First of all, Jai will give a summary of his work and his results. After that, we will have a short break. When we come back again, the opponent will examine the thesis and ask questions to, res to the respondent, who will have the opportunity to defend his work. After that, the examination committee will ask questions. And finally, I will invite questions from the audience, which will close the public defense session. After that, the examination committee will gather in a separate Zoom room for approximately 30 minutes to discuss the defense and decide whether the respondent has passed or failed. When they have come back to, uh, when they have come to a decision, we will all gather in this Zoom room again, where the sharp person of the examination committee will announce the decision. So now it's time for the respondent Jai Yang to present his work. Please, Jai, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Ida, for the nice introduction. And uh, now I feel myself really pepped up for the task. Uh, okay, thank you, everyone. I would like to thank for you to be with me here today in this uh, strange time. And I'm going to present my this is with the title of uh, Utilization of Cellulosic Biomass Towards uh, Sustainable Chemicals and Novel Biomaterials. And um, my supervisor is Magnus, uh, Magnus Nogan and uh, Hakan Yedland. Um, yes, uh, everyone in the world looks to save the environment, but um, it seems more harder and harder to accomplish. And some reports said within 30 years, there will be more plastic than we have fish in the ocean. And I believe no one wants to catch a piece of plastic when you're really trying to catch a fish. So it's very obvious that the, the, the current way we are consuming the resources is not sustainable. So we need to change. We need to, we need to adapt ourselves to the actual resources we have in the world. We need to go sustainable, we need to go green, and we need to go circular. And cellulose biomass as a cellulose as, as a concept of biorefinery, cellulose cellulosic biomass can serve many purposes. And it is the most promising alternative to replace fossil fuel to produce sustainable chemicals and also and normal biomaterials. We'll start with the uh, sustainable chemicals. The source of the sustainable chemicals in my work 
uh, it comes from the thermal mechanical popping of Norway's screws. Uh, thermal mechanical popping is a, a very well known process. And during the process, it uh, has a, uh, formed dissolved and colloidal substances. And those substances are in hydrophilic and lipophilic nature. They would aggregate, uh, aggregate to form pitch, which, which would later on give huge process disturbances and also inferior product quality. Uh, so our approach to solve the problem is to use this uh, induced air flotation together with uh, a foaming agent, uh, a DOTEC, uh, to collect the foam and refine the chemicals. And in this uh, collected foam fraction, we can uh, have uh, fatty resin acid, uh, steroesters, triglycerides, steroids, lignans, and also it must be mentioned here, the galactic glucmanin, it's very well preserved in the, in the processed water. So here, the, uh, we compare the solid content and the extractive concentrations in processed water and in the collected foam fraction. As we can see from the numbers, uh, the substances are enriched into the, from the processed water into the foam fraction. And also, if we consider the mass balance in the extractive concentration, we can conclude that uh, about 94% uh, of the extractives are removed from processed water into the foam fraction. And the next step is uh, we looked into the, the variance of uh, different extractive compositions. And extractive A, it's the uh, extractives from uh, process from freeze dried processed water, which is also our reference. And the composition B is the uh, freeze dried rejected foam, the extractives from freeze dried uh, rejected foam. And sample C is the extractives from the liquid liquid extraction of the rejected foam. And as we can see here, uh, the major components in uh, in the extractives is the triglyceride and steroester. They are badly affected during the flotation uh, after the flotation process. And uh, what has changed a little bit is the uh, uh, lignans and uh, fatty resin acids, which is more uh, which it, which the number changes is it's because of lignan. It's lignans. It's more hydrophilic and tend to stay in the water. And this can uh, numerically contribute to the number of increase for the fatty and the resin acid. And also compare the sample B and C. You can see there is uh, because we use the different extraction ma extraction method, so it gives a little bit difference in the compositions. Um, the next thing we looked into is the uh, is the lignin. As you can see here, lignin is also partially removed from processed water. And uh, this is because lignin is uh, amphiphytic. And the next thing we looked into is the uh, polysaccharide. Uh, in the process, comparing the, uh, the concentration of the uh, polysaccharides, the major ones are the mannose, glucose, and the galactose. And before, after the flotation, those uh, numbers are fairly effect uh, very affected. And it follows the uh, weight ratio of uh, four to one to one, which agrees with the, the major hemisolus in uh, spruce, the galactic glucomannan. And so this, after, after the sustainable chemicals, we looked into how to utilize the cellulosic biomass uh, to make normal biomaterials. Um, as we all know, the cellulose is the most important biopolymer on Earth. So it is our go-to choice. But uh, one thing, uh, one question one cannot escape from during the utilization of cellulose is how to dissolve it in a better way. Um, so there's a few commercialized methods for dissolving cellulose. For example, the whiskers process. Um, but it has uh, certain drawbacks. For example, the, the, the production is quite complicated, quite, quite complicated. And the, the cellulose is just also needs to have the, um, 
carbon disulfide presents to help the dissolution. And also the, the whole production cost is quite, quite high. And um, another commercialized process for dissolving cellulose is an MMO lysops uh, process. Uh, compared to the viscous, this is an improvement, but uh, it, it still has certain drawbacks. For example, the NMMO chemical is quite expensive, and uh, this method requires high requirements on cellulose quality. For example, it needs to have a very low um, polydispersities on the cellulose molecules. And also in the process, it uh, forms uh, NMMO cellulose byproduct which we don't want to have that. And um, then we, we have the third options here, which is a cold alkaline and uh, urea. Compared to the other two, it has the um, advantage of a low cost in chemicals. It's um, more environmental friendly, and also it doesn't involve common disulfide. So it's a non, also it's a, it's a non-toxic production. So this is, uh, we choose this to further, in the further study. Uh, but before utilizing the, uh, the, the cellulose dissolution, we need to understand how cellulose is uh, dissolved in the cold alkaline solution. Uh, when you put cellulose fibers in the high alkaline solutions, it would introduce the hydroxide group ionization and also it would, the fibers will be extremely swollen, but uh, it won't be dissolved yet. And there's uh, a lot of discussion and uh, some, of, some of the discussion agrees upon that this is a poor solubility. This is because of the uh, hydrogen bonding network uh, among the cellulose molecules. Uh, but if, if, if we look at the cellulose molecules, it does have uh, hydroxide groups at uh, C2, C3, and C6. But um, the hydrogen bond energy in between cellulose and cellulose and cellulose and water, it's at the same level. Uh, so it won't uh, make sense that the hydrogen bond is stopping the cellulose from being dissolved. Uh, we need to look at the cellulose molecules from different sides. Uh, if you look at the CH groups located um, located to uh, which is uh, uh, particular to the cellulose molecular chain, they are hydrophobic. And when you place the cellulose fiber in the, in the aqueous solvent, they would uh, those groups would stay would, would tend to stay with each other to minimize their exposure to water. So we need, a, we need a chemical to mitigate this hydrophobic interaction to help the dissolution. And a third factor here is the, uh, the cold temperature. So in the cold temperature, the cellulose can, can, uh, can have a more promoted polar conformation, uh, which can help the cellulose dissolution. So all these three factors combined, the cold, the alkaline, and the urea can help us to dissolve the cellulose in a better way. Uh, so after after we manage to dissolve cellulose with cold alkaline and urea, um, we start to make uh, examples of using utilizing this uh, cellulose. The first example is to prepare the nanocomposite spheres. Uh, in the preparation of the spheres, we have two different rules. The first one on the left, uh, you have the dissolved cellulose, which is dripped into the acidic. Um, uh, chitosan solution in acetic acid. And uh, on the right side, you have uh, cellulose and chitosan solutions, which are premixed equally first. And uh, if one is, uh, if a crosslinker is also added here, then the mixture, premixture is added into the IO bus to use uh, water in IO emulsion to uh, form these spheres. Then we can look at the morphologies of these spheres. The first one from, from the dripping method, uh, you can see the, the size distribution of, of these spheres, it's about one to two millimeter. And uh, one, 
quite interesting features here is that the the shell has a um, the sphere has a shell uh, shell structure, and the for another one which is a cross-linked microspheres and the size distribution is about 100 to 100 to 200 microns. And the third one, which is non-crosslinked uh, cellulose chitosan um, complex spheres, it has the size distribution in about uh, 30 to 50 microns. And then we looked into the, the chemical composition of the, all the spheres. Um, it's quite interesting that um, for the macrospheres, uh, you have the and chitosan, uh, which is um, mostly distributed on the surface on the shell, which is we confirm we compare the uh, the nitrogen content uh, from XPS and elemental analysis, and uh, for this uh, spheres prepared with the water water in all emotions, uh, the chitosan is more evenly distributed across the spheres. So the second sample is um, of novel biomaterial from cellulose. It's the nanocomplex films. But the first, it, beca uh, it begins with uh, you have the cellulose. Then cellulose is dissolved and uh, casted on the uh, glass substrate with a control thickness of uh, one millimeter. Then this is uh, immersed in the regeneration bath, uh, washed, cleaned, and then you put it in the rapid curtain for drying. And then in the last step, you can get a, a very nice, good looking film. And for the chitosan film, it follows the same route. But uh, for the nano composite films, uh, it needs to pre mix in the cellulose solution and chitosan solution in desired ratios, and then follow the rest of the steps. And then we put uh, we put the nanocomplex films into the acidic testing medium, and we noticed that uh, the the samples has the, the thickness of the sample has increased significantly. And also we looked at the uh, the structure of the swollen films, and you can see that with the increased chitosan, the pores has, are getting bigger. And considering the uh, the solubility of chitosan and acidic pH, we believe the chitosan has been dissolved. So we looked into the weight loss of all the samples at different pH. Uh, as you can see, in uh, at pH three, with uh, increased chitosan uh, content in the composite film, you have uh, increased the weight loss. And uh, when the P when the pH becomes more neutral, the, the weight loss of the samples is also um, decreasing. Uh, and the weight loss at pH seven uh, of say seventy five um, or the other it's uh, complex samples, it's uh, because of a partial protonation of the chitosan as a neutral pH. Uh, and also, we took the C75 to look further into uh, the speed of the weight loss at pH 3 and 5. As we can see here in the first three hours, um, the speed of the weight loss is fairly low, which is mostly because uh, at this um, during the hours, the osmotic pressure starts to build up and the, the protonation is also uh, ongoing. And with the time goes by, the weight loss starts to accelerate. And also at the end of this test, the speed starts to level off. And also it needs to be mentioned here, uh, even after 12 hours of the test, we still have uh, quite much left, uh, quite, much, quite much chitosan uh, left in the sample. This is because of the chain entanglements of cellulose and chitosan. And the third example for the utilization uh, of dissolved cellulose is cellulose hydrogel. Uh, we all know cellulose 
cellulose solution in the cold alkaline and urea, it's metastable. And uh, in that sense, we need to, and uh, it's metastable, it's uh, both temperature and the concentration has a good, uh, great contribution to that. So we need to find, we need to find a cellulose concentration which, have, which has the least thermal gelation impact. As you can see here, we have um, 4%, 3%, and 2% cellulose. Uh, in most of the temperature program, the, uh, the all the three samples behave like liquid-like. Uh, but when the temperature gets close to 60, the 4% and 3% cellulose solution gelled. Uh, which we get, which it's uh, where where the storage modulus become greater than the loss modulus, and the all-in sample uh, which not gel it's the two weight uh, two weight percent of cellular solution. So we uh, we work further with this concentration. Uh, we have uh, two different uh, curing uh, curing approach for for preparing the uh, cellulose hydrogel. The first one is uh, curing at 60 degrees for uh, 30 minutes, and another one is at uh, 23 degrees for 12 hours. And also, you can see here, we have a different addition of the uh, cross-linker uh, in, in, the, in the preparation. And here, the picture on the left, it shows the uh, rheological behavior of the um, cellulose, uh, cell cellulose hydrogel pre preparation. Uh, if we can divide this temperature curing procedure into two parts, which is uh, before and after the, the uh, before and after ten minutes. Before the first ten minutes, the temperature starts ramping up from twenty three degrees, and uh, after after the first ten minutes, the temperature reached to reach to sixty uh, sixty and start to uh, equilibrate. And the only sample has uh, the only sample has uh, has gelled before uh, before the first ten minutes. It's this uh, it's CG six hundred and three, which has the highest addition of uh, uh, cross linker. So this is because of the kinetic of the cross linking is more promoted. At the at the with, with higher with, high, with higher concentration of cross linker and higher at higher temperature. Uh, for the other two samples, which has a, a relatively lower concentration of uh, addition of the cross linker, the gelation happened after the temperature reached the sixty and uh, equilibrated after for several minutes. And the sample on the right side is for the hydrogels, which is cured at 23 degrees for 12 hours. Uh, as we can see, with a uh, different amount of addition of the cross-linker, the it behaves quite differently. So, with the highest uh, for the highest addition, it has the the, the shorter the shorter uh, gelation time. And the, the lower addition has longer gelation time. And the, the gelation time of the samples ranges uh, from uh, about three hours to up to six hours. And then we can we looked into the cellulose uh, hydrogen morphologies of the uh, for the sample A. It's uh, it's the reference without any addition of the um, crosslinker. And then with the increased uh, cross-linker addition, you can see the pore size uh, increased a little bit, increased uh, uh, quite much. Uh, this is because uh, uh, at higher temperature, the uh, the cellulose uh, self-association and the precipitation it's uh, it's promoted, and with this would lead to the enhanced uh, local concentration of cellulose. And this would further hinder the movement of uh, cross-linking. So this 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 is why the larger pores is uh, formed. And when you have the samples cured and cured at uh, lower temperature, um, the 
the self-association and the precipitation of cellulose also happens, but uh, it, ha it happens at a much slower rate. Uh, which means when the, uh, when the crosslinker is uh, uh, it's pre it's presented in, in, the, in the environment, it would have enough time to build up the network to form more fine structures in the, in the hydrogel. And also we, uh, we evaluated the water uptake capacity or the swelling ratio of, this, of all the hydrogels. And we can see here, uh, this sample cross-linked hydrogel with the, uh, 603 with the highest addition for cross-linker show the, the highest uh, swelling ratio. And this is because of uh, the bigger pores and also because of the high addition of the, uh, the uh, MBA, which uh, promotes the water uptake. Conclusion. Yes, uh, from the work, we can conclude that uh, the induced air flotation combining this with this surfactant DOTAC uh, enables very selective refining of lipophilic e extractives from the TMP process water. And also after the after the flotation, the hemicellulose is uh, very well preserved in the process water, which can be used for further uh, applications. And um, with, with knowing that the key to cellulose dissolution here in the aqueous solution is to, is to mitigate the hydrophobic interaction. And with that knowledge, we can make cellulose uh, compliance with uh, tunable functionalities. We, for example, we can, uh, we can adjust the size of the compliance spheres and also adjust the, uh, the, comp that, uh, the components distributions. And also we can change the pH responsivities of the films. And also we can tune the, um, the swelling ratio or wa water uptake capacities of the uh, hydrogels. And if we put the cellulose biomass, which is the core of the topic, and we have the different uh, chemicals and application uh, by the side. Then we comes to what is the next branch, and then we come to the future work. Uh, first of all, it's uh, films. We have uh, we have had some uh, uh, unreported data, which support that the, this cellulose film is a very good uh, oxygen barrier at the dry state. Uh, even if even at uh, fifty percent relative humidity, the the barrier property is still very good, but uh, it is uh, quite poor uh, in the moisture barrier. So our thoughts it's um, it's it's very it would be very interesting to blend in other polymers um, to have to have a barrier film with uh, with moisture, grease, and oxygen barrier properties. And we also need to think how can we tune those properties according, uh, according to different applications. Uh, for example, would this film be used in, in the coffee cup or would this film be used in, uh, in the salad box? And also we need to keep in mind that in, uh, uh, under the circumstances of the um, circular economy, the recyclability and the reprocessability is very important feature as well. And also, we have mentioned about this uh, uh, cold alkaline plus urea can dissolve cellulose in a very good manner, uh, in, in a very good uh, uh, manner. And uh, comparing comparing that with the uh, uh, whiskers and the lysol process, so it's um, it is highly interested to look into the uh, spinning uh, spinability of this. Um, cellulose though in uh, with uh, with the hydro uh, with the high alkaline and the urea and also the process uh, process chemical recovery it's a uh, highly interesting to 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 keep the production cost down and also re recyclability and uh, reprocessability 
Yes. Um, I would like to uh, thank you, Magnus and Norgen, no, thank Magnus Norgen and Hakan Yellong for supporting me uh, and blaming me in the over the years. It has been really important for me, and uh, also for the for the the tremendous uh, guidance during this journey. And uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Professor Bjorn Lingman and also Professor Bruno. Uh, without your help and uh, guidance, I wouldn't be uh, sitting here and uh, defending my thesis today. And also, I would thank all my colleagues, um, the lovely colleagues in uh, Mid Sweden University, and also my friends. Uh, in uh, FSN, uh, Ron, Derek, uh, Alirisa, Carolina, which is not in the picture here today, but uh, also Ida, and uh, yes, everyone. And also, thanks everyone to uh, who's uh, here today with me uh, in the dis in the disputation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jai. I suggest that we all unmute um, and uh, give Jai a big round of applause. Yes, thank as, uh, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, as announced before, we will now take a short break uh, and meet again in this Zoom room at um, 10.40. <laughs>